We're now going to take a look at permutation groups. Now I said in the last video that I sort of went out of order from the parts of chapter five. So there isn't actually a section in your textbook called permutation groups. It says definition and examples. We're going to look at the definition and examples now that we have a good understanding of what a permutation is. I also wanna to stress to you that if you have not yet watched 5.1, you need to watch that before you watch this video or there may be some things that are a bit over your head if you're not quite familiar with what we talked about in the last video. It's important to recall that because we're talking about a permutation group, the group will in fact meet all of the criteria from the definition of a group. So again, I've just recopied an earlier slide when we were first learning about groups, but remember that a group has closure which means if I multiply, or in this case, because our operation is composition. So if I compose two elements of the set, the result will still be in the set. Associativity, that means I can group them differently um, and still get the same result. Identity, there is going to be an identity element. So depending on what your, uh, how many elements you have in the set, say one, two, three, four, my identity element would be one, two, three, four, or written in cycle notation, that's one, two, three, four. And of course the inverse, which we've talked about. So if I had one, two, three, four, um, the inverse, let's make this three, four, one, two. So if this is A, the inverse would essentially be me saying which element mapped back to that. So what mapped to one, three mapped to one. What mapped to two, four mapped to two. What mapped to three, one mapped to three. And what mapped to four, two mapped to four. So we know how to find the inverse. We know how to find the identity or what the identity is depending on how many elements we have. And I'm basically just telling you that it is going to be associative and closed. Let's take a look now at the permutation group D4. Now you might be saying, hold up, I thought that was the dihedral group D4. And yes, you're right. What we're going to do is we're going to look at the motions of the symmetries of a square written instead as permutations. So we're already very familiar with this group, which is why I wanted to start our examples with this group, because we already are familiar with the way everything works. We've made the Cayley table, part of which you can see below so that I can fill it in with the permutations. Uh, we know it's a group. We've already verified everything. So let's take a look at how I would write this as a permutation group instead of using the rotations and reflections we're familiar with. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just assume that this is going to be F and that any rotation is going to be 90 degrees counterclockwise, just as we did before. So let's take a look at how I can write this as a permutation. Well, we know that E, we've already said, is going to be one goes to one, two to two, three to three, four to four, because for the identity, nothing happens. Now let's look at R. R is a 90 degree rotation counterclockwise. So one would end up here, two would end up here, three would end up here, four would end up here. Now here's where you have to be very careful. When I'm writing my permutation, I'm not going to say that one went to four or four went to one or vice versa. What we're trying to do um, I am going to say that four went to one. What we're trying to do is say, where did the value go based on these set positions? So what position did it go to? So how am I going to write that? I'm going to say one ended up in the two position. So one went to two. Two ended up in the three position. So two went to three and three ended up in the four position. So three went to four, four ended up in the one position, so I'm going to close it. Now, how am I going to find R squared? Well, R squared could be found by squaring R. So I could take one goes to two, two goes to three. 
3 goes to 4, 4 goes back to 1. Close it. 2 goes to 3, 3 goes to 4, 4 goes to 1, 1 goes to 2. Close it. Now let's verify that that's going to be the same thing that happens if I actually rotate it. So let's get rid of these numbers on the outside. 1 going 90 degrees twice or 180 degrees means 1 ends up here, 2 ends up here, 3 ends up here, and 4 ends up here. So how would I write that? I would say 1 ended up in the 3 position. So 1 goes to 3, 3 ended up in the 1 position, so 3 goes to 1. And again, 2 to 4, 4 to 2. So we see that they are exactly the same. Let's continue. Again, for our last one, we could just multiply it 3 times or take r squared times r. But let's go ahead and do r cubed. So 3 positions. 2 goes 3 positions, 3, 4. So how would I write that? R cubed would be that 1 ended up in the 4 position, 4 ended up in the 3 position, 3 ended up in the 2 position, and 2 ended up in the 1 position. So that's all of the rotations. Now let's look at the flips. Now, of course, these would all change based on where you put your flip, whether it's horizontal or vertical. Um, I'm using a horizontal. So my flip is going to take 1 to 2 and is going to take 3 to 4 and 4 to 3 because they're just going to flip across that line. Now what happens if I do RF? Now be careful because we've already talked about the fact that function composition says go from right to left. So that means the first thing I'm going to do is flip. So, oops, this is 1, this is 2, this is 4, this is 3, and then I'm going to rotate that 90 degrees. So, 1 is going to move over here, 4 is going to move over here, 3 is going to move over here, 2 is going to move over here. So, how would I write RF? Well, 1 ended up in the 3 position and 3 ended up in the 1 position, but 2 and 4, as you can see, stayed right where they are. So this is really just 1, 3. Now I should be able to take R, 1, 2, 3, 4, and F, 1, 2, 3, 4, and still get that same result. So let's double check that as well. If I do that, I would get 1 stays the same, 1 goes to 2, 2 goes to 3. Then I would say, whoops, don't close it yet. Then I would say 3 goes to 4, 4 stays where it is, 4 goes to 1, close it. Then I look at 2. 2 stays the same, 2 goes to 1, 1 goes to 2. And then I look at 4, 4 goes to 3, 4 stays the same, 3 goes to 4. So you can see by composition, I can get the same result. So let's finish up with the last two then. Again, the first thing I'm going to do is flip. Get rid of all the other hubbub. So one, two, three, and four. And now I'm going to rotate twice. So that means this is four, this is two, this is three, this is one. So what do I have? I have one ended up in the four position. 4 ended up in the 1 position, 2 ended up in the 3 position, and 3 ended up in the 2 position. And lastly, I've got flip, and then rotate 3 times. So this is now 1, this is now 2, this is 4, and this is 3. So how would I write that? I would write 1 maps to 1, 2 is in the 4 position, 4 is in the 2 position, and 3 maps to itself. So this is my entire group D4 written as a permutation group under the operation of composition. Now I do want to point out to you that just as before, when we talked about this, we said we had two generators. So what are the generators? R 
and F. Now, could there be other generators? Yes, you could use any rotation um, that's not R2 and any reflection, and that would generate the set as well. But it's important to understand that we still have the same concepts that we learned before. But what this tells us is I could take R, R squared, R cubed, and then take F, which is one, two, three, four, take R composed with F, R squared composed with F, R cubed composed with F, and get every single element in the set. The other big group that we're going to look at in terms of permutation groups is the symmetric group, which is one that will continue to make an appearance through our studies. And the symmetric group is a permutation group of all one-to-one -one functions from a set with n elements to itself. And of course, this is just a regular permutation, so there are n factorial ways to permutate a group with n elements. So the number of elements in the symmetric group is n factorial. Now keep in mind, we're saying that's the number of elements in the symmetric group, not in the set that's being permutated. So we're going to look at S3, which is a permutation group of the elements 1, 2, and 3. So the group itself, I'm sorry, the set that we're going to permutate has three elements, but the symmetric group is going to have three factorial or six elements. So the order of S3 is six. Now, what are those elements? Well, the identity is going to map 1 to 1, 2 to 2, 3 to 3. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually write these in array notation uh, just to make sure that it's a little bit more clear. So 1 to 1, 2 to 2, 3 to 3. So what we want to do is we want to think about all the different ways that we could multiply this. So I could have 1 goes to 2, 2 to 3, 3 back to 1. We'll call that alpha. And then we're going to have, just as we had before, we're going to have alpha squared. So we're going to go ahead and think about a, a generator of the group. So we have alpha squared. So alpha is going to end up being a generator. And then alpha squared would be if I performed that action twice. So if I performed it twice, one would go to two, then two would go to three, and then two would go to three and three would go to one, and then three would go to one and one would go to two. So that's alpha squared. Now, what we need in order to generate the entire group is another generator, um, because if I perform A three times, what's going to happen? Well, one goes to two, two goes to three, three goes to one. So I'm going to end up back at the identity. So this is like alpha cubed. So essentially what I need is another generator. And another generator we'll call beta is just going to be a two cycle. So essentially I'm going to keep one element stationary. So I'm going to choose to keep one stationary and I'm going to permutate the other two. And then I'm simply going to compose those. So alpha beta. Now, I'm using the same beta that they use in the textbook, but it's important to understand that I could still get the entire group if I used beta to be 1, 2, 2, 1, 3, 3. You would still get it. The, you would still have a group of all of the elements. They would just kind of be in a different order, same group. So alpha beta means first I do beta and then alpha. So that means one goes to one, and then alpha says one goes to two. And then beta says two goes to three, alpha says three goes to one. And then beta says three goes to two, alpha says two goes to three. So that's alpha beta. And then I would have alpha squared beta, which would take I'm just going to go ahead and use this alpha squared. So beta would take, let me go ahead and write one, two, three. Beta would take one to one, and alpha squared would take one to three. And then beta would take two to three, and alpha squared would take three to two. And beta would take three to two, and alpha squared would take two to one. And again, I just want you to note that everything on this line, here I've got one item that is um, stationary, 
here I have one item that is stationary, here I have one item that is stationary. So if I would have chosen a different beta, which was a two cycle, it would just have those same three elements, but maybe just in a different order. So I do want to point out as well that all the symmetric groups except for S1 and S2 are non-abelian, which means of course that you cannot uh, commute, they won't, you can't change the order without changing the outcome. We're going to finish up chapter five with the properties of permutations.